Well, you ready for this, Will? I'm ready. Heck yeah. Welcome to Two Man Congress. I'm your host, Chad. And this is Will. So to begin this episode, we're just going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing. And uh, we're going to be discussing the Constitution, the two different ways to look at it that most people look at. So you got the original, uh, originalist way of looking at the Constitution, and then you've got a contemporary method of looking at it as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to be explaining that through this and we're going to be doing this Q&A style so I'm going to be asking Will questions because he wrote about this topic back in um, let me look at the date again April of 2021 so it's almost been a year and so he has a decent amount of knowledge I would say only a decent amount (laughs) you you could say I'm a resident expert and that's about it (laughs) Uh, give yourself some credit (laughs) Anyway, so I'm just going to be asking him some questions because my, me, myself, I'm more or less an, a noob, <laughs> for lack of a better term, of uh, all the different like terms like textualism, uh, historical, structural, all that stuff that ties into the Constitution. Um, so we're going to look at like the Supreme Court, how that affects the Constitution, and yeah, do you want to... Talk a little bit about that, Will. Yeah, so the reason why this is an important topic today and the reason why we're talking about that in this episode is because, well, Justin Breyer, Justice Breyer just announced his retirement, and so we're going to have a new Supreme Court justice being nominated very shortly and then confirmed shortly after that. And, of course, there's all the politics that goes into that. Uh, the court's never been unbiased, even though it's seen as supposed to be an unbiased entity. And so there's a whole bunch of things that goes into that and the way that they interpret the constitution. So the debate is really how is the constitution a living or a dead document and how has the Supreme court seen that? And even though the legislature's involved and the president's involved, it, this debate is really a question between the relationship of the Constitution and the Supreme Court and how they uh, work together in determining whether or not laws are constitutional. Mm. So how would you define what the Supreme Court is? How does it affect your average listener? So the Supreme Court is a body, one of the branches of government, the judicial branch of government, where their primary role is to take the Constitution and any laws that are created by the state or by the federal government that are challenged because of their constitutionality. The Supreme Court takes those laws and says, yes, this is constitutional, or no, this is unconstitutional. And because it's unconstitutional, you need to do this, this, and this to fix it. So they have really one main role. Uh, they, they've got other tasks that they do as well, but their biggest role is, yes, this is a constitutional law, and so whatever issues that you have with the law are invalid or B, this is an unconstitutional law. So here's what we're going to do to fix it. Okay. So basically they, um, like we had the recent case where, uh, like the mandates with the vaccines, you get billed for 40,000 for, um, a willful noncompliance. And then like 14, if you accidentally broke it, yeah, for businesses that have more than 100 employees. And this was reviewed by the Supreme Court uh, just a few weeks ago and was ruled an unconstitutional mandate uh, or really just saying that OSHA did not have the constitutional authority to put down this law. And so that's one of an example of something that the Supreme Court would review because they would take that case, they would question it, and they would come back with an opinion that states what their ruling is about the issue. In the case of the mandate, they said it was an unconstitutional mandate because OSHA exceeded its authority. And this really also starts to get down to how they interpret the Constitution because you had six justices who interpret it slightly different. There were a couple of concurring opinions, but... Uh, and then the dissent 
who interprets the Constitution in a different way, and that's why you have uh, major opinions and dissenting opinions. Okay. So um, that's just like one of the decisions of recent memory where uh, this would affect your average listener Um, because if you're working at a business, um, it's either you get cut because the business will go under if you don't comply to the vax mandate. So those kind of decisions is what the Supreme Court uh, focuses on. Um, where is it constitutional or is it not kind of like fo- fighting through that foggy material? Mm-hmm. So why is it so important uh, or why are the Democrats really excited. Yeah, like excited for this justice to step down? Well, because... Uh, Justice Stephen Breyer was more of a left-leaning justice, and so a lot of his opinions ended up resulting in opinions that the left like and that the Democrats like. And so by him stepping down before the uh, 2022 midterm elections, because they don't know what's going to happen in the 2022 midterm elections, this allows Biden to have an opportunity to nominate a supreme court justice without having to worry about whether or not they're going to be confirmed okay. and so this is a chance where well they they get to maintain a seat uh, that keeps a left-leaning vote and that's where the politics really comes into it is because i there, mean there's that fear that the well Democrats they have, they have to get lose. nominated yeah and so Democrats but, are going to choose someone who have their political belief, and if they have the majority, and then those people get confirmed. Mm-hmm. There's also the fear of losing the House and the Senate in 2022. Yeah, so they, they, they want to try and beat that timeline, and they will succeed in beating that timeline for sure. All right, sweet. So I guess we could hop more into the originalism versus uh, contemporary uh, viewpoints. Mm -hmm. So do you want to define what each of those mean? Yeah. So just a very quick overview. This is where we start discussing whether or not the constitution is a living or dead uh, document as the Supreme court sees it. So you have originalism, you have contemporary methods, and then there's kind of a middle ground between the two where Mm -hmm. they keep kind of like an originalistic approach, but they try and apply it to, Uh, what's going on now so originalism a very quick brief overview is this document is should be interpreted exactly as the founders saw it and there's two ways to look at that it's either how the founders intended the constitution to be or exactly as the founders wrote it down so that's one way you have the middle ground which are kind of procedural where Mm -hmm. they deal with precedent where we followed the most recent Supreme Court case where they made a decision and we don't want to break away from that decision. And then you have contemporary methods where they, I think of it in the way of ethical, where morals today are different than morals um, back when the founders were in. Like, for example, slaves were fine back when the founders wrote the document and slaves now are wrong when... And so they believe that the Constitution should be interpreted to meet those morals because the founders had morals and they wanted those morals met. And that's why they wrote down the Constitution. And so that idea should be transitioned over to today because today's morals are different than the morals of the Constitution's Mm -hmm. founding. So the uh, contemporary viewpoint is more or less kind of like how Apple has their software updates. That's how people look at uh, the (laughs) Constitution. That's a good analogy, yeah. Mm -hmm. So just like updating it uh, to today's. uh, Updating it specifically with recent cases that are challenged uh, to the uh, constitutionality of laws that come before the Supreme Court. Okay. So let's just start with... Um, the middle ground, because that's where I'm assuming where most of our viewers are at. Um, so once again, if you want to follow along, we're on the two man Congress page. Uh, just look at the article that was posted on April, uh, 29, 2020, uh, 21. We'll link it in the descriptions below. Yeah. To make it a little bit easier. 
So let's just look at this first one. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and what it means? Yeah, so it's called stereodecisis or doctrinal. And this is, if you've ever heard the word precedent before, that's exactly what this is. So stereodecisis in Latin literally means stand by things decided. And so using this method, the courts are going to stand with their past rulings. And very rarely do the courts actually move away from their past rulings. There are examples of when they do, but they typically have a very strong reason of why their past ruling was actually an unconstitutional ruling. And so stare decisis literally just means we're going to keep the same process that we had before. Okay. Do you have an example that could go along with that? Uh, Roe v. Wade is a good example where Roe v. Wade was decided and then you have uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey where Roe v. Wade, the framework of Roe v. Wade was altered, but ultimately Roe v. Wade was the precedent that was used to decide Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Okay. I think that's a pretty good example to use because, sorry, my voice kind of died. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Because everyone kind of knows about that one. That's a pretty famous case. And that case is actually most likely going to be challenged in the Supreme Court again. So we'll see if that precedent continues to stand or if that will be changed. Okay. All right. Let's go on to number five. How's that one pronounced? (laughs) So it's pragmatism or prudential. And what that is is it explores all the methods of constitutional interpretation. So it'll look at some forms of originalism. It'll look at some forms of ethical and it'll look at some forms of procedural or uh, stare decisis. And it'll just decide which one fits best. It's the catch all kind of way of interpreting the constitution is like this one makes the most logical sense And so this is the rule that we're going to use. Okay. So this is probably the method that the Supreme Court uses for the most part when trying to decipher what cases are constitutional, which ones aren't. It depends because each Supreme Court justice uses their own methods of interpreting the Constitution. Okay. Sweet. So let's go to the originalism portion. So let's just start with number one, textualism. Um, you want to explain a little bit about that, Will, and what it means? Um, yeah, yeah. So textual- I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory, but yeah. So textualism is probably the most simple. It has a lot of strengths, and it also has quite a few challenges as well. Uh, Scalia uh, was probably the most famous Supreme Court justice for his use of textualism. All that means is the Supreme Court was written this way. This word literally means this, and so we're going to interpret the Constitution to mean literally that. So any case that comes before the Supreme Court, if it means right to bear arms, well then it's the right to bear arms. And we don't deviate from that whatsoever, because that's exactly as it was written, and that's exactly as the founders meant it to be, and so that's exactly as we're going to interpret it. And so there are strengths to that because, I mean, it keeps the Constitution from changing all the time to be free-flowing, and it makes certain that the Constitution still has some structure. The weakness is that a lot of words, even back then, still had double meanings. So a certain word then could have a different meaning in a different context, and you can't exactly know what kind of context that was being used. So that's textualism in a nutshell. There you go. I'm assuming right to bear arms doesn't mean bears and arms. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nah, I'm just joking. That was supposed to be a funny dad joke, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, all right. So historical, that's number two. So this is more fully encasing both the text as well as the history of the constitution. So, This is what the founders were intending when they wrote the Constitution. Did they intend the right to bear arms to mean always, or did they intend the right to bear arms to mean only to maintain a militia? And so they take all of the historical analysis, they look at the papers of the Constitutional Convention, 
they look at what founders said it was supposed to mean and things like that in making sure that their interpretation stays as holistic as possible. And again, there are strengths because the Constitution doesn't change very much using this method, but the weakness is founders had conflicting ideas. Yeah. And some founders thought this meant this, and some founders thought this meant something else. And as a result, there, there are strengths and weaknesses to using the historical approach as well. Awesome. And then structural is number three. Um, and you could explain a little bit about that as well. So structural is just maintaining the principles that the founders wanted to maintain. For example, federalism or uh, checks and balances. And federalism is just states' powers and federal powers stay separate. And so whenever they're interpreting the Constitution using this method, they just want to make sure that those founding principles remain unchanged. So federalism stays intact. Checks and balances stay intact. Anything else uh, like that that is essential for the framework of the branches of government uh, will remain unchanged, and that's how those justices will use structural structural interpretation of the Constitution. Yeah. So basically using... I will just use the house for an example. I, you frame a house up and then you like decorate it and all that kind of stuff. So structural is literally um, the framing of the house. It's the frame of the house. It's what the shape. Yeah. So the decorations yeah. might change, but the frame will not mm -hmm. unless it's something completely detrimental happens. But the, like a metaphorical fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To our but. Constitution. <laughs> um, but the basic shape like for us it's we could always analogy. change yeah we could always change the color of our house uh we could always switch out our tvs um but we cannot change the actual shape of our house because um you've got things like the foundation that's strong mm -hmm. um you've got everything that's bolted in the whole that like, you just that's can't a change really it. good analogy mm -hmm. that's exactly what structural interpretation is because unless you want to tear the whole thing down and then yeah because the founding fathers saw federalism as a key essential point to maintaining the uh, structure of the constitution if federalism shatters then so does the constitution and so their goal in that essence is to try and protect that framework sweet so we're going to go to the complete opposite end um contemporary which is, as I explained earlier, the software update of, <laughs> yeah, of the Constitution, I guess. And so, yeah. So, yeah, sorry, so, yeah th there are basically two ways to use contemporary methods. The first one is called ethical interpretations, and that's where the founding fathers had morals, and we have morals today. Those morals are different today, and the Constitution didn't protect those morals then, so we need to interpret the Constitution to protect the morals that we have right now to make sure that those are protected the same way other morals are protected in the Constitution. And so this is probably one of the most free-flowing forms of interpretation where things can change because things have changed, if that makes sense. Yeah, so... You used the example earlier. Um, like, we don't have slaves anymore. so And we know that slavery is bad, but that wasn't as clear back in the 1700s. And that's where I see the ethical interpretation come in. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you believe that the Constitution promotes slavery, doesn't promote slavery, complete opposite, like that doesn't matter. That's where, well, it does matter, but... That doesn't matter to the context that I'm trying to bring to the table right now. Uh, that's where the ethical interpretation comes in. Exactly. And that's it's because of this form of interpretation and the originalistic form of interpretation where there's a heavy contention for, for the Supreme Court for having power in the Supreme Court because the originalists don't like cases for example, like Roe v. Wade, because privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution, but um, because it's 
implied throughout several of the amendments, it's interpreted to be as part of the Constitution. And that's a case where the ethical sense uh, overpowered the, uh, the originalistic justices. And so that's why those kind of cases exist and why there's a big debate between originalism and contemporary methods of constitutional interpretation. Beautiful. And then the last one that uh, you'll use is polling and jurisdictions. Yeah, so this is probably the least common used. And in fact, it's kind of most likely used in tandem with other forms of constitutional interpretation where the Supreme Court justices will just look at other cases that happen in the states or other cases that happened in other lower courts, lower federal courts, and they'll just look at those things, they'll compile them together, and it's like, okay, so here's a ruling that kind of fits those cases that happened beneath us, and this is what we agree with as being a constitutional law or unconstitutional law. Perfect. Sweet. So hopefully you as a viewer has a, a little bit better of an idea on um, how the Supreme Court reads the Constitution uh, constitutions, the top seven ways of interpreting it, and hopefully you learned something today. I did. <laughs> uh, hopefully you guys did as well. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. So we'll we'll go on and have a quick break, and then we'll just talk about some of the arguments for and against originalism versus contemporary methods of constitutional ratification. Feedback first. All right. We are extremely happy to announce we got feedback. So we, we got some feedback. <laughs> yeah, we got some feedback. So a lot of positives, some things that we can work on. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, we could work on in the next couple of videos is making our um, debates more interesting or engaging so that they don't seem to drag on. Less dry. <laughs> yep. So we'll probably end up doing stuff like punishments for the loser. I'll probably get punished a lot, but <laughs> hey, it's knows. all good. So if you guys want to mention in the comments what kind of punishments you want to see, like we could do ice bucket challenge kind of ish. And but, we can do votes you know. as well. You guys can say uh, who's the winner and who's the loser and things like ice bucket challenge. What are you thinking? <laughs> oh, it's cold and it's winter. It should be pretty good. Yeah, no. <laughs> I dipping yourself in ice is really beneficial for your body. Like I guess when so. I was in Florida, I would be in a um, sauna and then I jump in the icy pool or whatever. Just like, it's like a bunch of knives stabbing into me. Well, as long as you're the one <laughs> losing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so also uh, our Patreon, uh, we still got our three tiers. We got our, judge tier legislator and executive you could check out patreon get an idea of what each of those tiers do uh, the executive has the most benefits and it goes down from there yep uh, each of them are given certain powers just like the federal branches of government are given so it's something to look forward to and it's something that's really exciting so we hope you check it out the website is patreon.com slash two man congress so that's p a t r e o n dot com slash t w o m a n c o n g r e s s, and that's patreon dot com slash two man congress. Yep, we love your support. We love you guys that support us already. It's awesome. Yep. <laughs> All righty, let's go ahead and hop into some of the arguments for and against originalism and contemporary ratification. All right, so once again, another Q&A session. We're going to be looking at the arguments that are typically used in debating whether or not to look at a contemporary viewpoint or an originalistic uh, viewpoint. So we'll just, I'll just be asking those type of questions. We'll be answering. That should be great. So uh, let's just start uh, by getting the cat out of the cradle, I guess. So, uh, Is that the phrase? <laughs> I guess. So, what kind of arguments would a originalist usually make? And yeah, you could go into details about that. 
Well, the biggest argument that originalism is going to make is, well, for just jump back to imagine that you're in 1987 and you are in the process of the Constitutional Convention and you're drafting this constitution that is meant to shape the way government is supposed to function. And it's supposed to shape how government functions for centuries, hundreds of years, and hopefully even thousands of years. And, well, wouldn't you just be really careful with the way that you would draft that document? You'd be very particular with what words you included. You would be very precise with what you said about those things. And you take that into the Bill of Rights, and you're like, okay, well, to get this passed, we're going to need a Bill of Rights. And so you're very particular with what's written in the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights started with over 30 amendments and then whittled its way down to 10 that were finally confirmed and ratified as part of the Constitution. And so you would be very careful with all of this information, especially since this is supposed to be the supreme law. And so even though we are living in a changing country, it's not the responsibility of the Supreme Court to change the Constitution. That's something that happens through the amendment process, and the legislative branch is very clearly given that direction of how it's supposed to be done. That's written out in the Constitution, and it has happened it's rarely happened, but it has happened. And so if you really want to change the Constitution and how it's amendment, the Supreme Court is not the way to do it, and it should be the legislature. And that's how the originalism kind of shapes their arguments. Okay. So I'll just ask a few questions um, that I'm assuming a contemporary person would make. As kind of a rebuttal? Yeah. So... I guess like we we now like we look at science today and and it's different yeah so like science changes uh society changes uh like for example we used to put leeches on people hoping that they would uh it would cure them so seeing how the constitution and these um different kinds of uh like important governmental documents uh, age over the years wouldn't it be preferable to incorporate certain cultural norms um, that are more applicable to our day and see that's the thing as well is I mean of course the founding fathers had values that were implied through the constitution that they would try to preserve through time but if these things are going to change then they did determine a way that it could be done without the Supreme Court. And they determined the amendment process. And so that's the biggest counter-argument, is the amendment, the Constitution, in its final article, was said, this is how you amend the Constitution. So the Constitution is the living document in the sense that it can be amended, but originalism argues that it should remain as close to it as possible, because, well, it, it maintains the structure of the United States by keeping it as close to original as possible. That's the biggest counter-argument, is things are different now, yes, but... The overall arching theme of the Constitution hasn't aged with time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And... and as far as science goes with leeches, I mean, the, it's obviously not going to be part of the Constitution. Yeah. I was actually looking at something like a month ago where there's actually like, um, like in the leeches saliva. Don't quote me on this. It's just something I read on the Internet. So <laughs> uh, there's actually a property in their saliva uh, that actually does help with blood clots. So um, people will actually use leeches still sometimes. Yeah, well, I can't confirm or deny that, so I'm not yeah. going to speak on it. Yeah, and I just read it from the internet, so, yeah. <laughs> All right, so, uh, what kind of, or I guess we'll just, like, go to the opposite side. What kind of arguments would a contemporary person normally make, aside from the one that I just um, mentioned in my cross-examination? Well, contemporary arguments try and maintain the same process of thought, at least to start where they go back to the founders 
And specifically, they want to focus on the founder's intent in preserving certain values or morals. And so they wanted to maintain freedom, life, and freedom of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, those kind of things that you uh, read in the Declaration of Independence. And they wanted to preserve privacy and they wanted to preserve free speech and things like that. So they have a list of freedoms that they wanted to preserve. And even though some of those things aren't exactly written or put into the Constitution, because they are implied, we can use amendments in the Constitution to write that into law. And so the world is changing, but we still rely on the founders' moralistic ideals in making a change to... Uh, benefit society as it currently stands today okay so a question that um, I would ask would be where uh, would the um, like amending and when would it uh, become too much uh, when it comes to radically ratifying the whole structure of the Constitution where we risk losing everything that we know today as. And that's where the Supreme Court, as well as the legislature, comes into a play where there are checks and balances. So you can't just change the Constitution willy-nilly because there are these things that, if there are challenges to these rulings that are made by the Supreme Court, and then the legislature can go and make those changes. Or... You could even use the amendment process. And there, of course, are weaknesses because it, it's free-flowing, but ultimately it has the benefit as well as making sure that certain freedoms are protected, that the founders wanted to protect, but because they didn't want to just write down everything, because if they wrote down everything, then when would the list stop? Yeah, And, and it wouldn't. And so really it's just we want to preserve those morals that the founders wanted to preserve as well and there are weaknesses to the originalism as well in the sense of i mean the founders had different intentions and they had different goals in mind they uh had didn't know exactly how the constitution wanted to be shaped because and you see that throughout their papers is one founder would say something completely else about another founder and these things would combine to create problems and so there are weaknesses to both originalism as well as contemporary methods but ultimately they both have strengths all right well so for closing arguments can you give a quick overview of what an a originalistic person would end with so Basically, originalism has one main goal, and that's to keep the Constitution as much as possible as it was as when it was written by the Founding Fathers. And so you don't want to include things that weren't included in the original document because that might just end, it result in this never-ending flow of amendments that aren't part of the Constitution. So keep it as close as possible as the Founders thought. And then making sure that any amendments that do result happen the way the Constitution directed it to be written. And that is through the legislature and not through the Supreme Court. Perfect. And we'll just do the same thing for contemporary. What kind of closing arguments would a contemporary uh, minded person to close with? So the founders had morals and we have morals today. Sometimes those morals are different. The founders had slaves. We don't. And now, and same kind of thing, the founders wanted privacy, and we still want privacy, but they didn't include privacy in the amendments of the Constitution. So, but they intended it. And so the Constitution can be read to have privacy written in the Constitution. And so they have morals then. We have morals now. Because of that, the Constitution can be interpreted in such a way to match the way that life has changed today. 
Well, thank you for listening. We're going to go into implications, what, what this means to you as a listener, and how you could implement this. So Awesome. Yeah. So from what I could see, um, me representing an outsider, <laughs> um, what this would mean to me if this is the first time that I was learning about what the Supreme Court does, all these different ways of looking at the Constitution, um, it would put in a better perspective of why it's important to understand these kind of things because, uh, like, let's just look at the court. Like, you got Roe v. Wade, you got ugh, Roe v. Wade, you got um, this last court case that came out in January uh, with the Sixth Circuit of Appeals where um, you had those businesses that were suing the federal Tax government. Mm -hmm. So with all that, uh, it's very important for our average loose listener to understand each of these different terms. And that's yeah, great. So what do you think about what kind of implications this would mean to your average listener? Well, there are two really big implications that I see are really important. The first thing is the knowledge, exactly as you mentioned. This knowledge is important because, and, and this is the second thing, because when Supreme Court nominations occur, those aren't done by the people. Uh, those decisions are made by the president and then confirmed by the Senate. So really, you, you, the way that you have a voice in who is confirmed is through your votes of who becomes the senator or who becomes the president. And so you have to think about what the president and what the senator's uh, opinions are as far as how they interpret the Constitution and who they are most likely to pick as those nominations in order to help understand who you're going to vote for when it comes to 2022 or 2024, 26 or 28. And so you want to make sure that you have this knowledge so that you can make good informed decisions on who to vote for. Of course, this knowledge is important other than just uh, Supreme Court nominations. It's important to know because, well, how do you interpret the Constitution? And what does the Constitution mean to you? And to me, the Constitution means a great deal. I mean, that's the whole point of why I'm doing this podcast with Chad is we want to understand the Constitution and we want to interpret it in a way that is going to be beneficial for uh, as many people as possible. And so we want to share this information so that people have that resource to make really good choices with their lives uh, because who you vote for shapes what kind of country you live in. So true. So when it comes down to it, uh, things that you can do to really, um, really like make a difference is um, in your life is by going out there voting for the people that you want to vote for that do have your values um, and that's the best thing that you can do and that's as well as saying the main reason why we're doing this podcast so you guys have a better understanding of how the constitution works uh, how laws work and it's just it's great and I'd say it's the amazing. second thing that you could do is by being an active voice uh, politics shouldn't be a taboo topic Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. but it shouldn't be. And it's kind of disappointing that it is. I mean, I know it causes family arguments, and uh, you have these discussions that could be beneficial or not beneficial. But by sharing your love for the Constitution, by sharing your love for the country, and by sharing uh, your feelings with those that are close to you, you may make a difference in this world. Mm -hmm. And that's our ultimate goal make a yeah. difference yeah politics doesn't have to be polarizing it could just be what it is yeah all right well i think we should leave it at that what do you think yeah that sounds great to me well thank you for listening and we'll catch you on the flippity flip uh please leave a like subscribe follow us on 
uh, Spotify, we got Patreon, uh, we have a bunch of other stuff, uh, yeah. Apple Podcasts. That's where I normally listen to my podcasts. <laughs> and please give us a review as well. Uh, the more information we have about how we're doing uh, will give us really good positive feedback on uh, what we can do to improve. Sweet. Well, thank you, and we'll catch you next time. All right. See you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro. And you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited. The only ones that aren't are pre-law materials. And the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice. And with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.